Good evening. Welcome to the third in our series dealing with the Ark of the Covenant. And today we're going to get into some of the more technical theological terms, a term that you may not be familiar with, propitiation. Now, this is not a term actually that is somehow made up or some uh, esoteric theological term. It's actually a biblical term. You can find it in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And so as we're dealing with the presence of God, we have a problem because he's holy and we're sinful and sinful being sinful incurs a debt against that holiness of God. So how do we manage to be in his presence and not be annihilated? And so there is a payment for that sin, payment for righteousness sake, which is to propitiate God's wrath. So uh, Daniel Hyde will explain it tonight, but it is quite fascinating because it is a very relevant, very biblical term that will help you understand the significance of being in the presence of God. We come in a New Testament sense, especially in terms of worship, we're just coming in, coming into the presence of God because of Christ. But as we actually begin to appreciate what it meant to come into the presence of God, especially in an old covenant sense, it should really help us to understand what a tremendous blessing it is. Even still today, those, for example, of our Roman Catholic friends would say they need an intermediary, maybe Mary, one of the saints, or a human priest in order to come into the presence of God. But actually, understanding of what it means to be in Christ and have the sufficiency of Christ's righteousness uh, attributed to us, and our sin being atoned for by Christ, has that unique privilege of coming into his presence. So tonight we're going to look at the comparison from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, specifically relating as how we can come into the presence of God in relation to Romans chapter 9. So one quick announcement before we begin uh, our series for tonight in terms of having a presence, a physical presence. The, the physical presence should be very busy this coming Monday. We're looking forward to Vacation Bible School. And so we've had some uh, registrations, some late registrations. It's helpful to register as early as possible because then we can make sure we have enough teacher staff, enough materials, uh, everything sorted up. If we have a, a bus show up at the, at the registration table, Alex will be uh, pulling out his hair. So it'd be very much appreciated if you can register online, uh, safehavenworship.com. We have a tab for that registration, and you can ask any questions you want. It just helps us to keep track of all the materials. So pray for that. Any donations for this will be uh, appreciated, as you noticed in the announcements. We're looking forward to some other events coming in, even this summer, like a movie night and some other things that will help us, and we'll keep you up to date with everything that's going on. So for tonight, for our study, let's open with prayer and uh, look at the presence of God. Father, we thank you that you are in our midst, that you are omnipresent. And because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the tremendous privilege it is to come into your presence. And we have this ability through the, uh, the work of Jesus Christ and from the uh, assurance of your spirit that to think of how you reside in us as believers in Christ with your spirit, helping us to understand our sinfulness, understand your righteousness, lead us on the path of that righteousness, and even correct us as we transgress your law. Lord, that we would not quench your spirit, that we would, uh, that we would have our hearts softened, and really in a new covenant sense, this is what you said what it means to be in you that we would no longer have a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh, a heart attuned to you and your righteousness and the wonderful privileges of having that. So guide us through your truth tonight. May we be not only awed of what it means to come into your presence, but e eternally thankful and grateful and blessed because of it as being in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Well, we normally save the best for last in life. That adds a sense of excitement and suspense to different parts of our lives. Think about Christmas, for example. We bring lots of gifts out for our kids, maybe for our new husband or new wife, 
And what do we do? We bring out a bunch of gifts, and we always bring out that best one for last, whether it's the biggest whether it's the most expensive or whether it's the one thing that he or she really, really want. We bring out the best for last. Uh, we read a good book, and the suspense is, is, uh, cre- is being created, and the drama and the, the height of the, ten- uh, of the tension, and uh, we resist reading the end. We want to get to the end. We want to get to the resolution. The best part is last. Now, Jesus also operated that way. He once went to a wedding. And they all had their fill of wine. And then Jesus turned water into wine. The master of the feast thought that it was the bridegroom who had brought it out. And he goes and he sampled it. And then he said, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. He kept the best for last. Now, imagine using that uh, in your mind. Imagine approaching the tabernacle. Here's what you see. This big curtain that surrounds the courtyard. You see an elevated bronze altar as you enter in. Then there's a little basin with water to wash your hands and your feet. After you enter into the first veil, you look to your right and you see a table with some bread. To the left, you see the menorah or the the lampstand. And then straight to the back where the great veil is that separates the holy place and the most holy place, there's a little altar of incense that's burning and there's smoke. Just beyond that veil is the Ark of the Covenants, the most important part and piece of furniture in the tabernacle. But while the Ark of the Covenant was the most important piece of furniture in the tabernacle, the surprising thing is that it's not mentioned last. In fact, the Lord, as he gives instructions, again, he tells Moses in Exodus 25, verse 8, let them make me a sanctuary. And he goes on to give a list of instructions for what to build and how to build it. What's the first thing that the Lord instructs Moses to build? The ark. It's the best thing. It's the most important piece of furniture. And the Lord saves his best gift, not for last, but in fact, he doesn't save it at all. He brings it up first. He surprises us by doing this because we're used to doing it our own way. But let the Lord has his own wisdom. And so he takes the best thing and he puts it up front first to teach Israel some really wonderful lessons and to teach us as well. Well, what's an ark? We call it the Ark of the Covenant. Well, what's an ark? An ark is just a box. That's what it was. Uh, And uh, in ancient religion, boxes like arks were parts of furniture in religious ceremonies and religious uh, aspects of worship. Uh, In other cultures, for example, their arks, their boxes, would contain images of their gods, their deities. Israel's ark, though, only has things that God gives. And so he gave certain things to put inside. No images of himself, but he gives a sample of the manna that he had fed the Israelites with in the wilderness. The staff that Aaron had that budded with like almonds was placed there. And the two tablets of the law were put there. And by placing those tablets of the law, what Exodus calls the testimony, Moses was following ancient practice. The Lord, in fact, was commanding Moses to follow ancient practice. Because in the ancient practice, you would have an ark in a lesser and a greater kingdom's places of worship. And in those arks, those boxes, would be placed a treaty between the great kingdom that had defeated this lesser kingdom and the lesser kingdom, which now was a servant of the greater kingdom. And in each ark, there would be a copy, and they were placed at the foot of their God in their holy place. In Israel, though, the wonderful thing is that both copies of the law, the testimony, the covenant, both were placed in the one ark at the foot of God himself. It was a way of saying that God himself was going to be the covenant keeper, that God himself was going to uphold his relationship with his people No one could deny that. No one could take that away. God himself was going to uphold by his amazing grace. Uh, So we come to the Ark of the Covenant in our study of the tabernacle and what it teaches us about our relationship with God. Uh, Why was it so important that it was listed first? A couple of things to mention and for us to think about and ponder here. First of all, the Ark of the Covenant was the place of God's presence. It's the place of God's presence. God's presence. 
And the Lord, of course, was present with his people everywhere. We know that. But yet he localizes that great presence of God in the tabernacle. Let them make me a sanctuary again. Verse 8 of chapter 25, that key passage. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. So the tabernacle is the, the presence of God. But in a more specific way, more particularly, the Lord focuses his presence in one place in that great tabernacle. That's the Ark of the Covenant. Notice what chapter 25 of Exodus says at verse 22. We read this, there, he says the Lord, there on the Ark, I will meet with you. On the Ark of the Testimony, I will speak with you. Now think about this. The eternal God who's not constrained by the bounds of time, Uh, The infinite God who's not bound by the constraints of space. The transcendent God who's not bound by anything. In fact, he's above all and he's in all and through all time and space. And the immense God who fills it all condescends this low to the weakness of his people, to his little son, Israel. He becomes manifest for them in one place. This God who's everywhere at once. This God who is above the heavens. This God, this God of the tabernacle, our God, is not bound by time. But he binds himself with the time-bound experience of his people. This God is not bound by space, but he binds himself to the box, this ark. This God is above all creaturely constraints but he binds himself to these creaturely constraints. God is everywhere, but he was there in particular. What a God we have. What a God who has us in the grip of his grace and his hands. This is a God who, in the fullness of times, of course, stoops so low, he condescends down to us. He humbles himself in Jesus Christ to the point of death. Yea, the death of the cross. That's how far our God stoops. That's how low he is willing to go for the sake of his people. And so the place of presence, God's presence, focused in the Ark of the Covenant. Well, how? How is he present there in the Ark? Well, the Ark is a symbol of the throne of God himself. Uh, Notice in chapter 25, if you have your Bible open of Exodus, 25 verse 12 tells us that there are four rings of gold on its four feet. Why? Why? Four rings of gold. Why four feet? Again, verse 13 and 14, there are two poles that went through those rings. What's significant about that? Verse 14 says it's to transport it, to carry it around, of course. But notice the poles go through these holes, these rings, in the feet of this box, this ark of the covenant, which means that when the priests would lift it up, they would literally lift it up above themselves upon their shoulders lifting it up above the people, treating him like a king would be carried in a carriage above his people. Now, that's in stark contrast for what happens later on in the days of Samuel and the days of the prophets and the judges when Uzzah takes the Ark of the Covenant from the land where the Philistines had placed it, and he does not use the poles that God commanded to carry it above the people like a king, but he builds for the Lord, this great God who's present in the ark, he builds for it an ox cart. He doesn't treat God as a king. He treats him as something common. He treats him like an animal. As well, God is present in the mercy seat, as verse 17 goes on to say, uh, which was the lid of the ark. And upon that lid, verse 18, there are two cherubim, two angels of gold, kneeling at the feet of the Lord in worship. Uh, The Lord meets with his people there. Notice verse 22. From above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim. The lid then is the footstool of the throne of God. The Psalms say it like this. Psalm 80 verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who who are enthroned upon the cherubim's shine forth. Psalm 99 verse 1 says the Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. Those wings then are his throne. They are the seat to the throne. The the lid is the footstool of the Lord himself. 
Now, unlike the gods of the nations, the God of Israel could not be contained since his throne, the word of God says elsewhere, is in heaven itself. Earth is just his mere footstool. Yet, again, he's condescending. He's lowering himself. He's coming down like a parent comes down to a child uh, to speak and babble and even to taste baby food, to get that little baby to eat that food. God is condescending down. He's showing how low he was willing to go to relate to his children. The tabernacle then is the house of God. Uh, The ark is his throne, just as the Holy of Holies is the throne room. He's also present in the ark because with the ark, there was a cloud of glory. Uh, We don't see that here in our passage, but I'll have you turn with me uh, to a passage in just a moment. But think about the clouds of glory that have happened before the story of the tabernacle throughout Genesis and Exodus. God tells Abram to sacrifice animals and lay them out in in halves, one half on this side and one half on that side. Abram falls asleep and the Lord passes through, doesn't he? Like a flaming, smoking fire pot, like a smoking kiln passing right through. Later on, when he redeems his people, he brings them out of Egypt. What does he do? He leads them by day in a pillar of cloud, by night in a pillar of fire. Later on, as they camp at the foot of Mount Sinai, which is where the tabernacle narrative is taking place. In chapter number 19, we're told that the Lord would come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. How? In a thick cloud that wrapped around the mountain in smoke. And it went up, Exodus 19, 18 says, like the smoke of a kiln. The same terms that are used back in the book of Genesis with Abram. How is that cloud of Abram, the cloud of the Exodus, the cloud at Mount Sinai related to the ark. Turn with me over to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus adds a little bit of detail that we don't have here in this particular passage in Exodus 25, but we have this, Leviticus 16, the great day of atonement passage. Moses tells Aaron here uh, that he can't enter the Holy of Holies just any time he wants, willy-nilly, as we would say. Why? He tells him why, because, verse 2, I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat so that he may not die, we're told. He must not go whenever he wants, whenever he wants, because the Lord there dwells in a glorious cloud just like he had dwelt before. You see that in verse number 2 towards the end. So the Lord was present on the ark enthroned upon the wings of the cherubim with his feet upon the lid in that throne room of the Holy of Holies in the house of God, the tabernacle. Just like Isaiah would one day see this glorious God. He would see him high and lifted up, the train of his robe filled the temple. What does he see? He sees God himself in the glory of cloud and fire and brilliance. The fact that the ark was the place of the Lord's presence among his people brought them great assurance. Uh, This high and this lofty, this majestic, resplendent king who dwells above all things, but yet who dwells with them, he's dwelling with these grumbling, complaining, bickering, sinful people. You don't know who those people are, do you? Grumbling, complaining bickering, sinful people. The same God dwells amongst us, the same kinds of people. Thankfully, God is not afar off in some other lands, but he's near to us, even as sinners who call upon Jesus' name. The promise to us in the new covenant is that the believer who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, although he is absent from us bodily, that he has left us another helper, a comforter, the Spirit of God, the helpful presence of the Lord himself. We have his presence with us, even when just two or three are gathered together. In fact, the individual believer is described as a temple of the Holy Spirit. The ark, then, is a place of the presence of God. But how can a holy God, so immense, so infinite, and localizing all that glory in one place, how could he dwell with a sinful people, how could they ever approach him? Who are they? Nadab and Abihu, later on, Leviticus 10, of course, 
they just offer up the wrong kind of incense. And they're struck down by the fire of God. They were priests. Who are we? Can we stand before him? This brings us to a second point about the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant within it. An important theological term that we have to know and we have to believe and experience, propitiation. The Ark's the place of propitiation. Now, now think about it like this. Before I give a definition of propitiation, try to imagine just an earthly illustration that will give us something of the meaning of it. Uh, Mom and dad get mad at their son for disobedience. Uh, That never happens in your homes, does it? (laughs) Never, never. Grandkids are just wonderful. Now imagine you get upset. You get angry. Willful disobedience. Disrespect. Defiance. Now what has to happen for there to be some reconciliation? Uh, For you not to be angry, but to be happy again. Well, at least in our household, our children have to do many things, one of which is to sit in timeout for a while. After the timeout is finished, they have to explain to us exactly what they did that they have to confess. And then eventually, after after that is done, of course, we lavish upon them hugs and kisses. There's reconciliation. There's love, of course, which never left them, but it's now expressed. In a similar way, propitiation is that action of God himself to to turn away his anger from us and to turn towards us in love, grace, mercy. He wraps his arms around us. His wrath is propitiated. It's turned away. No longer is his face upon us in anger, but now his face shines upon us, as the benediction says. Psalm 85 expresses this when the psalmist is saying to the Lord in a a prayer that the Lord was favorable to his land, that he had restored Jacob, which had been in exile, which had been in sin. Well, how did he do that? Psalm 85, verse 2 and 3 say this, You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. That's what propitiation is. You turn from your hot anger. God literally turns his back, his anger away, so that his face that that is shining in grace and glory might come upon us. And so God gave a distinct list of instructions for the lid that is upon this ark, the place of propitiation, as the King's English renders it, the good King James, the mercy seat, the place of propitiation. God gives a list of what happens there, how it happens, and why. Uh, John Calvin summarizes it in his comments on the Ark of the Covenant when he says this, God was propitiated... His anger was turned away, and his grace was turned towards. God was propitiated towards believers by the covering of the law, that that lid that covered up what was inside, which included the law. So God was propitiated towards believers by the covering of the law, so as to show himself favorable to them by hearing their vows and prayers. For as long as the law stands forth before God's face, it subjects us to his wrath and curse, and hence, it is necessary that the blotting out of our guilt should be interposed so that God may be reconciled with us. This was a place of propitiation where once a year the high priest would go and offer that culminating sacrifice to turn away the anger, the wrath of God, and to bring the grace and the mercy and the love of God towards his people. As New Covenant believers, we know that these annual sacrifices and the great sacrifice, these are just types and shadows. We know that these sacrifices could not take away any sins. We know that these were always picturing something greater to come. And so as we look upon the Ark of the Covenant as believers in Jesus Christ, we see its reality. Its reality is found in Hebrews chapter 9 where we're told, For if the blood of goats and bulls, the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctify for the purification of the flesh. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus Christ alone, as the writers of the New Testament say, is our propitiation. He alone is the one who turns away the wrath of God for us because God's wrath was poured out on him, God's grace, Mercy and love can be poured out upon us. God provided a place then for this propitiation. That place 
is still existent. It's just found in Christ now. The Lord gave a place then for propitiation. And because of that propitiation, it's also finally a place for the people to respond, a place of pleading, a place where the people could come and plead their cause and beseech the Lord for his mercy and his grace. And we see this in various ways throughout Scripture as the ark is used in various poems and songs and prayers in the Psalms. Uh, Psalm 60 through, six, uh, Psalm 60 through uh, 85, this lengthy section, Psalm 60 to 85, deal with restoration, uh, repentance, renewal, revival. And oftentimes the Psalms then are pleading for God to change, and, uh, to change his actions towards his people, to change them to be restored in mercy and in grace. And for example, Psalm number 80. In Psalm 80, Asaph prays three times for the Lord to restore us that we may be saved. And he does that on the basis of what the psalm begins by saying. It begins by saying that the Lord is the one who dwells between the cherubim. The psalmist is saying, Lord, we look to you to restore us, to renew us, to revive us because you dwell upon the ark. You're present there. You've promised to be propitiated there. And now we are asking you to come save us who pray to you there. On the basis of that, we are encouraged to plead with the Lord because Jesus Christ is that place. He is that propitiation. And he calls us to plead with him, to pray. Well, what should we pray for? How can we respond to Jesus being the propitiation place of the ark? We need to plead with the Lord to restore and reform his church to revive his church in our time from its worldliness. We've become overly dictated by the world. The church is telling us what to do, and the Psalms cry out to God that it becomes so worldly, crying out to God to change, Psalm 79, for example. We should plead to the Lord for our own forgiveness. Again, Psalm 79 pleads with God, the God who dwells in the ark, to forgive and for the glory of his own name to deliver. We should plead with God for the salvation of our children, Psalm 78 again, talks about the Lord coming to save and writing his laws upon our children's hearts. We need to plead with God to save the lost. Psalm 67 asks God to be merciful to us, to bless us, that we might then bless the world and that they might come to know you. In the story of the tabernacle then, the Lord surprises us because the most important part of the the tabernacle's furniture is not saved for last, but is given to us first. Right up front, the Lord says, To his son Israel, my presence, my propitiation, your pleading is my gift to you. And so that when we read this as Christians, we know that the presence of Jesus Christ is with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. We rejoice in this propitiation of God's wrath towards us. And we can rejoice knowing that we can plead with him, the God who dwells upon the wings of the cherubim. Hopefully you've noticed, even that sequence through the Psalms, a pattern. Psalm 78, a plea to save those we love. Psalm 79, a plea to forgive us. Psalm 80, a plea to restore or revive us. And I just want to touch on this before we get to the book of Hebrews chapter 9, because we've been praying and talking about the nature of revival. Let me give you a historic example and a biblical example. Historical example, in turn of the century, uh, uh, northern and western New York, uh, you probably recognize the name Charles Finney. Charles Finney had a lot of revival meetings. They were very uh, emotional events. But the problem is, it wasn't based on the presence of God and the repentance of sin. And as soon as the difficulty came through early in the, the days of the Depression, that all, the, all those areas of so-called revival dried up. All the churches closed. Where was that revival? And I can affirm biblically, we just looked at three passages, Psalm 78, 79, and Psalm 80. Whenever real revival comes, historically, look in um, 
the New England Revival. Look at the, the 1809, uh, 1908 rather, Welsh Revival, and on and on and on. Without exception, revival comes in a very acute awareness of the presence of God, His holiness, and the need for repentance. It does not come through emotionalism. It comes through holiness and repentance. And so if we really want revival, praying for those who are unsaved that we love, praying and pleading for the forgiveness of God, restoring the joy of our salvation. I met with somebody today, and uh, we talked about uh, John Piper's work, uh, When I Don't Desire God. There just seemed to be that uh, lack of the, the joy of, of the things of fellowship and worship. And getting back to what it means who God is. Because often when we focus on ourselves, we're, we're very poor gods. <laughs> we, can't, we can't uphold the universe. But when we get back to an understanding of who God is, everything changes. So let's look at how everything has changed in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Because uh, this is a, a passage that talks about, in verse 1 through 14... The characteristics of the old versus the new covenant, which we will go through in the explanation of what we understood tonight, what the, the holy place and the mercy seat and everything that represented with the Ark of the Covenant. So if you have it open, Hebrews chapter 9, if somebody would please read verse 1 through 14. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up um, in, in its first room there was a lamp stand the table and the consecrated bread this was called the holy place behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place which had the golden altar of incense and the gold covered ark of the covenant this ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The, the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been <coughs> uh, disclosed <coughs> as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. And when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by the, his own blood, having obtained eternal uh, redemption, the blood of goats and bulls, and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, uh, sanctified, 
them so that they are outwardly clean, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, and cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Thank you. Hopefully you realize through this, even as verse 9 would stand out, all this is symbolic for the present age. These are object lessons to teach us something about who God is, what Christ has done. And, and what's fascinating is it's actually an illustration of faith itself. Because think of who this is being written to, to the, the Hebrews, and it's the same problem with Jews today. Uh, what do you mean I have to give up the sacrificial system? What do you mean I have to give up uh, all these other things? And how do you explain to somebody who this is all they know through thousands of years of lineage that everything that those sacrifices and those rituals point to has now been fulfilled in Christ? I would say even for our Roman Catholic friends, how do you convince them, hey, it's not through the intercession of Mary or some other saints or a human priest that you're coming into the throne room of God. You're coming in through faith in Jesus Christ. And if that's your, what you're used to, it can be obviously a very difficult thing. But Hebrews chapter 9 is actually a picture to help us understand these realities. So the first question dealing with verse 1, in what way... Uh, is there a great significance in the Old Covenant? There are good things in the Old Covenant. How can we say that? According to the verse 1, it gave information, regulations, and instructions on how to do worship, and it also provided an earthly sanctuary. Yeah, it certainly did. And who gave it? God. God doesn't make any mistakes, and for this, uh, you can say a period of time, dispensation, there's different words of talking about it. This is instructions for God. This is instructions on how God wants to be worshipped, and this is the, the picture, and we'll get through further in our studies about the nature of a sanctuary, because, you know, if we talk about the resonant place of God, let me ask you a pop quiz. Where's the sanctuary today? Any ideas? In heaven. Well, ultimately it is. Yeah. Can you think of a localized place where God resides here on earth? In our hearts. In us. When we talk about the Holy Spirit residing in us, that is a discussion about God's presence or sanctuary. It's not, and this is the whole point of Romans chapter 9, it's not localized in a physical place we understand through having the Holy Spirit in us as God residing in us that we become the temple of the living God. We become his sanctuary that way. So we don't meet in a church. We are the church who then gathers for worship. And, and this is important with this. And so what we find here, these regulations for divine worship, the rites, the ceremonies, they're instituted by God to actually help us to show Christ the Messiah as being the true savior, uh, savior, and he's going to outline the significance of this. All right, the next question, dealing with verses 2 through 5. In what way did the old sanctuary personify holiness? You can even start with the concept of tabernacle. So... You couldn't just walk in... So access is very good. And remember, think Christologically. Think how all this is pointing and fulfilled with Christ. So if we're going to talk about access to the presence of God, how does Christ enable that? John 14, 6, for example. There's a lot of other places where Jesus explained specifically. Can you think of imagery that... Christ used to talk about access to God. I give you a hint with John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes unto the Father but by me. He explained that he is the door. He is the way, the access. And that's the whole point of the tabernacle here, 
it's not just some big open circus tent where you're wandering in in any way. There is a very clear way in. And remember, the east facing, we talked about as, you know, they were exited out of the garden from the east. Now there's the entrance back into God's presence from that same direction. And, it, and it's actually all fulfilled in this graphic presentation of who Christ is. And so there's, there's parts of furniture that are being talked about here, uh, including the, the laver or the basin. So what would, be, what would be, what message would you get in a New Testament sense of looking at that, for example, Old Covenant laver or basin? So what, why was that there in the Old Covenant, and how might that be fulfilled in Christ? First start in the Old Covenant. Why would they have a laver or a basin? Washed. So... Th- The whole point of that washing is that we would be defiled as we are in the world through the nature of sin. There is a visible imagery or picture on how sin defiles. There must be cleansing in order to enter God's presence. How is this fulfilled in Christ? Yeah, and we think, for example, the ordinance of baptism. There is that declaration about being in Christ and that, that God-mandated new covenant ordinance of baptism, of, sh- of declaring, explaining, showing the nature of being cleansed by being in Christ. Therefore, we are part of the community of faith. We are in Christ. And yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Yeah, because water is the essence of life, and he is the living water, and apart from him, you thirst and die, and so he is the the essence of what uh, life is. Uh, Okay, what about verse 3, about the, the holy place and the holy of holies? You notice how there is... The reference, and, and Nancy mentioned this, about only the priest could enter the holy place. Uh, and there were three pieces of furniture here. Uh, Hebrews mentions only two because it says it cannot speak of this detail. Uh, later on in, in uh, verse 5, for example. But what about the, the pieces of furniture here with the lampstand and also the sacred or showbread? What New Testament... Yeah. Yeah, the lampstand representing the light that will illuminate our dark world. Jesus says, I am the light. And what about the obvious reference of the sacred or showbread? I am the bread. I am the bread, which we're going to get through next week about uh, the, the focus of the, 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 the bread of life and, and that significance on how Christ explains how he personifies that. Now, this is interesting in verse 4, the altar of incense. So, what would this, what would this picture? Prayers. Yeah, it's interesting how often in a New Testament sense that uh, our prayers uh, are being right according to God's will are a sweet-smelling aroma, and that's the significance uh, of what this is, is picturing here that we understand it's not necessarily by the physical incense that uh, our prayers are, are, um, are a- appealing or a sweet-smelling aroma. It's actually talking about the, the prayers being lifted up for others according to God's will being that, uh, that sweet uh, aroma that way. And so behind the Holy of Holies, behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle which was called the, the Holy Holies and the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And there's three precious articles in there, the golden uh, jar holding manna, Aaron's rod, which was budded, and the tables of the covenant itself. Now it's, it's fascinating, now down to verse 5, about the mercy seat and the cherubim of glory. If you would recognize passages like... Um, uh, Exodus, uh, actually Isaiah chapter 6, about the reference of cherubim. I'm sorry if you've 
shopped at HomeSense and you see uh, those little fat little angels, that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> the angelic reference in, in Scripture is, is much different. What was the common reaction when uh, a human encountered the angelic? And it wasn't, hey, you're that fat little angel I saw at HomeSense. Was it wasn't that way at all. What was the reaction like in Isaiah chapter 6? There was fear because it was representing the presence of God, just like Moses came down from the mountain, represent, you know, being face to face with, with God and, and radiating his glory. And so what you find here is that these are the cherubim of glory and the glory is not of themselves, it's reflected of God. So just think about this in a New Testament sense. If we are to glorify God, think of reflection, if we are to glorify God, how do we do this in a New Testament sense properly? How do the angels do it? How can we act likewise in glorifying God? Or using the term I just mentioned, reflecting God. So as, as our actions are uh, as kind and forgiving and long-suffering and patient, the fruit of the Spirit, for example, we properly reflect God. So as these are the cherubim of glory, we glorify God as we reflect the character of God. It, when we fail to do that, which we're going to get into this Sunday with um, uh, Romans 2, 16 through the uh, 24, uh, we fail, we bring a reproach upon his name when we fail to reflect him. And so what you find fascinating uh, in this is that there's no direct access to the presence of God. Even the priest could only go on the, the Day of Atonement, according to this ritual, to access God. So uh, if What's fascinating here, we, we actually take this for granted, but just think about this for the entire people of God. All right, none of you have access to God, and only my anointed, the high priest on the Day of Atonement, can come into my presence. And we, and we think about, we don't even consider this in a New Testament sense on a place of worship, or even when we come in prayer, of actually entering the presence of God in prayer with directly with our petitions, coming corporately and glorifying God through our, our singing and our worship and our, and our, and our speaking and our sharing with that, uh, being in His presence, He's in our midst. This would have been so radical for an old covenant saint because just think about it, for thousands of years that would not be possible, but something we have through Christ. So if, for your notes, for example... 1 John 2, 2, it talks about Christ being that uh, propitiation, that payment for righteousness that we can enter God's presence. Question 3, dealing with verses 6 through 7, so we're halfway now. In what way did the Old Covenant services reveal something important about God? Well, first of all, what's significant about the, uh, how frequent the Old Covenant uh, sacrifices were? Verse 6. Well, notice how it says in verse 6, the priests go in regularly into the first section and performing their ritual duties. So there is regularly or continually, there would be the significance that, okay, the re an illustration here for the people of God that this, this physical sacrificing of, of bulls and goats, etc., is not is not fully propitiation or payment for righteousness. There would be the understanding of ongoing sin, the ongoing necessity of sacrifice. And we understand, for example, when we gather, I mentioned this in the Lord's table, we're not re-sacrificing Christ in the Mass. We're not re-sacrificing Christ at the table. It's do this in remembrance of me, of the sacrifice He's made once and for all. For what? For the propitiation, First John, uh, for sin. And this is distinguished from the continual offerings here. And what you reference, uh, summarized in verse 7, about the high priest on the Day of Atonement, and the Jews also use the term Yom Kippur. Um, and w this is in reference to Leviticus 16, about the nature of the, the liberation. Now, just think about this in terms of conscience. What... What is a letdown in relation to your conscience or your guilt 
if there needed to be a continual sacrifice for sin? How is it insufficient to deal with your conscience or your guilt? Sure, an animal had to die, but it's also related, uh, I'm going to use this theologically or religiously, with works-based righteousness. So every other faith system apart from Jesus Christ is works-based righteousness. If you do enough, just talk to the cults. I always deal with, whenever I deal with, specifically with the Jehovah's Witnesses, how can you get assurance of faith? They have no answer for that. How can you be assured that you're right with God? They have no answer to that. Do you know that you're saved? You have no answer for that. So it, it's simple. So let me get this straight. You want me to do a whole bunch of other things not mentioned in Scripture, and that will just increase my guilt. You know, this is the testimony of Martin Luther, for example, the Augustinian monk that knew the more rituals he do, the more he realized he fell short of God's holiness. But th this, this ritual would not alleviate guilt. Because we're, we're going to go through even that the sacrifice for those sins that you may not even realize. And this is the problem of working our way to make us right with God. We're, we're, it requires perfection continually. Perfect actions, thoughts, and words continually. And the slightest deviation from that perfection is a blight and a, and a failure of his perfect standard. So any kind of human work would realize that that would be insufficient. What's fascinating, when you think about John 17, for example, with the high priestly prayer of Jesus, he said, and now glorify me together with, with you with the glory which I had before the world was. And so uh, what we find here is that Christ is that perfect high priest, perfectly embodying the glory of God and returning to that glory that he had. Okay, second last question with question four. In what ways was the Old Covenant significance symbolic for the present age? Because it talks about how it is, in verse nine there, symbolic for the present age. So, it first starts off with the Holy Spirit. So why would that be significant? Why is the Holy Spirit significant for entering the presence of God different from the Old Covenant sacrificial system? What's the difference? What's the difference in our coming into the presence of God from the Holy Spirit versus the Old Covenant sacrificial system? Okay, Alex, you know this one, obviously. <laughs> And even the timing, I think he alluded to it, instead of the high priest doing it once a year on the Day of Atonement, having the Holy Spirit resident in us, that any time we can enter the presence of God through the perfect work of Christ, even the, Holy, uh, even the high priest when he entered, uh, there was great uh, intrepidation because, you know, was the sacrifice sufficient? Did it really atone for his sins and for the sins of the people? Uh, you know, there were references in our study, and there's two very, I wrote them in my notes, uh, they're very helpful to review. He talked about with Uzzah uh, carrying the, uh, the ark and the an ox cart in Leviticus 10 as well, Nadab and Abihu improperly approaching God. Uh, you can look at this in a, a new covenant sense about uh, those that would uh, uh, misrepresent in the book of Acts their offering coming before God and, and God striking them dead. Uh, it, <laughs> to, to say it really doesn't matter how you approach God would be pretty unaware of really the entire scope of Scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because even with Uzzah, um, he was sincere in trying to protect the, the dignity of the Ark of the Covenant, but he assumed that his hands were cleaner than the, the method that God had instructed through the carrying of the Ark through the poles, and God instantly struck him dead. And there, was, and there was complaint about this, and it was realized God has specified how he desires to be worshipped and approached. And it's, you can be sincere, but sincerely wrong. You can 
you can think, well, I've got a stomach ache. I'm just going to take something out of my medicine cabinet. And, you know, I just have a feeling that's going to work. Well, it could be uh, hydrochloric acid and it won't work out too well for you. Regardless of how sincere, you can be sincerely wrong in all these things. And so this is a, really a lesson for our age with this. And you notice how it deals with here uh, in verse, uh, nine, uh, verse 8, for example. Um, uh, about, uh, okay, go down actually verse 9 about offering these gifts and relating to the conscience. I alluded to this, you know, uh, there's no assurance of forgiveness you know, why, are, why do people get burdened by a conscience today, realizing they've messed up, there's no way out? Because unless you're resting on the perfect uh, sacrifice, forgiveness of Christ, you're going to realize that you've messed up, you're messing up now, and you're going to mess up. There's, there's, no, there's no alleviation of that burden of conscience. There's only really peace, Romans 5, through faith in Jesus Christ. Confessing that sin, trusting in his righteousness. Otherwise, our consciences will continually be burdened with this. Now, what about, why do you think the, the reference in verse 9 mentions it as a symbol? Here's a, here's a toughy question. The, the word in verse 9, I'll spell it out because if I say it, you'll get the answer instantly. The word for symbol is in, in the Greek, P A R. A B O L E. Can you think of a New Testament word that relates to symbol, which is a setting of side by side, hint, side by side uh, comparison for the purpose, uh, side by side relation for the purpose of comparison? So, what's the, what's the word here for a symbol? Verse 9. Uh, type. Yeah, okay, I think King James uses the word type, or the other word is obviously parable. You know, Jesus used spoken parables, which was a story side by side with the truth he was discussing in order to illustrate it. And this is the, what is being talked about here, is that this is a parable or a comparison to help us understand in a new covenant sense about the cleansing. And then verse 10 that we understand that the sacrificial system was limited, imperfect, temporary, and it related, as it says here, only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the true time of reformation. And so this time of reformation is really to make straight or correct or perfect what was only in types and symbols that came before. I don't know. Finally, the fifth question, dealing with verses 11 through 14. In what ways are the characteristics of the new covenant a fulfillment of the old covenant? First of all, in verse 11, what is, what is new here? Yeah, so there is a, there is a fulfillment of the old covenant priesthood. And what about in the presence of God? What is new in terms of the presence of God? Well, you notice how it says there is, uh, when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have, that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, or another word in some translations is tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So, if we're talking about a presence of God where God resides in a place not made with hands, not of this creation, where might he be referring to? Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, talks about that. Here, I'll read it. This might help. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where is this perfect tabernacle not made with hands? In, in heaven. And this is the whole point. You know, we get a good sense, for example, of earthly worship, but the whole point of good earthly worship is to realize coming into the presence of God. And when we think about this, 
we're, we're gathering around the great throne room of God with those who have gone before us. Uh, the, the saints of God, the martyrs, the old covenant believers, or with the heavenly hosts, for example, and with all those who name the name of Christ here on earth at the same time. We think about, you know, especially in the summer, well, there's just a few people. I guess a lot of people are traveling. Yeah, but it talks about, as Hebrews said, a great, crowd, a great cloud of witnesses we have come in the presence of. You know, we're not just looking who's physically present around, but those, yes, who might be shut in, but those who must as well be the, the heavenly hosts, the saints that have gone before us, etc. We're actually supposed to have that mindset. That is the corporateness of corporate worship. Everyone who is in Christ throughout all of time is gathered in worship when we worship. It's, it should give us a much different sense of what the corporate and corporate worship is all about. What's new in verse 12? And what's the significance of that? And so that whole picture of a payment for righteousness once and for all for the forgiveness of sins is what? Which is our big theological word of the day. Once and for all. Payment once and for all for the forgiveness of sins is a long sentence that can be condensed in one word. Propitiation. That's, this is what we're talking about. Verse 12 is an explanation of what propitiation is. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. And so we, un we understand this, is that this, is, this has happened once, the perfect sacrifice. And that's how we can have an eternal redemption. And just think about that. It's also clarity for being born again. Some people misconstrue being born again while well, my sins are forgiven. If that's all it was, what happens when you commit the next sin? You're just as guilty as before that you know, slate was wiped clean because, oh no, now you're, you're no longer perfect before the eyes of God and going to face his just wrath and condemnation. But being in Christ, verse 12, an eternal redemption. That's how we can understand uh, the uh, assurance of salvation that all our sins, past, present, and future, as they have been repented of, are forgiven in Christ because of an eternal redemption secured through Him. This is, talk about something that should alleviate guilt, alleviate worry, give you assurance, give you confidence, really, about being in Christ of this work that He's done. What about in verse 13 and 14? What new significance do we have here? Right, and so even the requirement for the Old Covenant sacrificial system would be a lamb without blemish, etc., which is pointing, of course, to the ultimate lamb without blemish. Since the, the sacrificing of heifers and goats and lambs would need to continue, what should that tell you about the nature of the Old Covenant sacrificial system? It's not perfect, it's not complete, it didn't perfectly atone. This, but now Christ, who is without that perfect atonement, without blemish, was perfectly holy in satisfying God's requirements. And because that, you notice how the text says about this, the end of the, the passage there? To purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Just think about that in terms of Christ's redemption in our lives. How often do we do something we think this is making no difference 
I'm wasting my time. I'm spinning my wheels. Why do I keep praying for this person? They've gone decades without repenting. Why do I keep sharing the gospel with people? I haven't seen anyone come to faith. Why do I keep going to church? Why do I keep being in Christ? Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. None of it's wasted. Not a single prayer done unto God, not a single word that is shared, not a single act of righteousness, not a single time of worship, and on and on and on is wasted. We're not just doing dead religious works, but our conscience should be purified and cleansed and clear that we are actually serving the living God because of the work of Christ. And that's, that's the difference between what, what we do in ourselves and... Um, uh, through Christ. Uh, we're not going to look at it, but if uh, Hebrews chapter 10, the next chapter over, and verse 22 says that we can draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so this all happens because of the work of Christ. And this, this is done once and for all for the forgiveness of sins. So hopefully you realize, which as you may have gotten bogged down and, well, what's this, and incense and these offerings, when we really look at it, this should change our conscience. This should change our awareness. This should change not only our thankfulness and our worship, but everything, you know, being as uh, Hebrews 12 and Romans 12 talk about, uh, living sacrifices unto God. We, we're not serving through dead works but living sacrifices that actually make an eternal difference. Now, I'll leave you with one last thought. Everything earthly we do, every house we've built, every car we've bought, every property we've owned, every painting we painted will pass away. Everything we've done unto the Lord, every word we've shared, every act of kindness, every time we've shown forgiveness and patience is eternal. If, if that should not change our perspective from dead works to, sh to serve the living God, I don't know what else will. Any final comments or questions? A lot to think about, isn't it? And hopefully you've come out of this hopeful because of all of what we've seen here in Hebrews chapter 9. So for next week, we're going to focus as a table with bread with that illustration from John 6, 30 through 50, Jesus as the true bread from heaven. Uh, how we see God fulfills that manna that is residing in the ark uh, in the person of Jesus Christ and all that significance. So thanks for joining us. Uh, look forward, if you still need the notes, Pastor Kratz at Rogers.com. Happy to send you a copy and look forward to the discussion next week. Good night.